This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson two from the series Rest in Christ is titled Restless and Rebellious, ready for teaching on July 10, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as restless human beings, and sometimes our restlessness causes us problems. But we know that we can put our trust in you. And this week, as we open your word, we pray your Holy Spirit will guide us, that we may see what not only do you want from us, but what you give to us to help us with the issues of life that we face day by day. Bless us as individuals, as families, as churches, as communities, that we may walk with you, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Over the centuries, many people have reported strange, restless behaviour in dogs and other domestic animals before major earthquakes. Scientists have now established that animals are able to detect the first of an earthquake's seismic waves, the pressure wave that arrives in advance of the secondary shaking wave. This probably explains why animals have been reported as acting confused or restless right before the ground starts to shake. Some animals, such as elephants, can perceive low-frequency sound waves and vibrations from foreshocks, which humans can't detect at all. A few minutes before the 5.8 magnitude quake that hit the Washington, D.C. area on August 23, 2011, some of the animals at the Smithsonian Institution National Zoo started behaving strangely. Among those were the lemurs, who began calling loudly for about 15 minutes before the ground started shaking. In this week's lesson, we look at some examples of strange human restlessness that was brought about not by impending natural disasters such as earthquakes, but rather by the basic sinfulness of fallen human beings who were not resting in what Christ offers all who come to him in faith and obedience. Sunday, July 4. Restlessness in a Wilderness Israel must have felt restless and unhappy when they departed Sinai on their way to Canaan. More than a year had passed since they had left Egypt. As we read in Numbers 1.1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt they were ready to enter the promised land. They had been counted and organized. They had witnessed incredible displays of divine favor and clear signs of God's presence. Yet their first stop following their departure from Sinai finds them complaining. Read Numbers 11 verses 1 to 15. What are the Israelites complaining about? Numbers 11, beginning at verse 1. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. 
Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its colour like the colour of bdellium. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on millstones, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, every one at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, and why have I not found favour in your sight, that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone, because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, Please kill me here and now, if I have found favour in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. The Israelites craved the meat, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic of Egypt. Who will give us meat to eat? We read in verses 4 to 6. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. They also must have suffered from severe selective memory when they remembered the food and forgot the slavery and unbelievable hardship, which we can read about in Exodus chapter 1. Let's begin at verse 8 of chapter 1. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigour. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigour. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives, and said to them, Why have you done this thing, and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. They had been fed by God's manna for more than a year, yet they felt restless and wanted something else. Even Moses was affected. Trying to lead a group of restless people is not easy. But Moses knew whom to turn to. Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favour in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people upon me? Numbers 11, 11. How does God respond to the complaints? Well, we'll read verses 16 to 33 of Numbers chapter 11. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. 
I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come out of Egypt? And Moses said, the people whom I am among are six hundred thousand men on foot, and yet you have said, I will give them meat, that they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them, to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them, to provide enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the seventy elders. And it happened, when the spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied, although they never did so again." But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of the choice men, answered and said, Moses, my lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on this side, and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. God is not deaf to our needs when we feel restless. In Israel's case, he gave them quail to satisfy their hunger for meat. But it wasn't really the meat Israel wanted. When we are unhappy and restless and angry, what we are angry about is often just the detonator, not the cause of the conflict. We fight because there is something deeper amiss, affecting our underlying relationships. Israel rebelled against God's leading, something that we all have to be careful about, no matter our immediate situation and context, for it's easier to do than we think. And so to finish the day... Why is it so easy to remember the past as better than it really was? Monday, July 5. It's contagious. Read Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. What were Miriam and Aaron upset about? Numbers 12, beginning at verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Ostensibly, Miriam and Aaron were unhappy about Moses' Cushite wife. 
Zipporah was an outsider hailed from Midian, as we read in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Even among Israel's elite, the fallenness of their nature was revealed, and not in a very pleasant way either. Is it ever? The biblical text, however, clearly shows this to be a pretext. The main focus of their complaint is about the prophetic gift. In the previous chapter, God had told Moses to appoint 70 of Israel's elders who would help Moses carry the administrative burden of leadership, which we read yesterday, but let's just look at verses in chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. And verses 24 and 25. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, and placed the same upon the seventy elders. And it happened, when the spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied, although they never did so again. Aaron and Miriam had been playing key leadership roles as well, as you read in Exodus chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. But he said, O my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do. And Micah chapter 6 verse 4. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage and I sent before you Moses, Aaron and Miriam. But now they felt threatened by the new leadership development and said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Numbers 12 and verse 2. How does God respond to this complaint? Read Numbers 12, 4 to 13. Why do you think God responds so decisively? Numbers 12, beginning in verse 4. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. God's response was immediate and leaves no room for interpretation. The prophetic gift is not a weapon to be used to wield more power. Moses was well suited for leadership because he had learned how extremely dependent he was on God. 
The fact that Miriam is mentioned before Aaron in Numbers 12.1 suggests she may have been the instigator of the attack on Moses. At this time, Aaron was serving as Israel's high priest. If he had been struck with leprosy, he would not have been able to enter the tabernacle and minister on the people's behalf. God's punishment of Miriam with temporary leprosy communicates vividly his displeasure with both of them and helps bring about the attitude change that this family needs. Aaron's plea for her affirms that he too was involved, as we read in verse 11, and now instead of criticism and restlessness, we see Aaron pleading for Miriam and we see Moses interceding on her behalf in verses 11 to 13. This is the attitude that God wants to see in his people. He hears and he heals Miriam. And so to finish today, Though it's always easy to be critical of church leadership at any level, how much better would our church and our own spiritual life be if, instead of complaining, we would intercede in behalf of our leaders, even when we disagree with them? Tuesday, July 6, Restlessness Leads to Rebellion This story begins on a positive note. The Israelites have finally reached the borders of Canaan and twelve spies are sent to explore the land. Their report is extraordinary. Read the spies' report in Numbers 13, 27-33. At which point are the expectations of the Israelites dashed? Numbers 13, beginning at verse 27. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. In spite of Caleb's intervention, the voices of the doubters and sceptics prevail. The Israelites did not set out to conquer what God had promised them. Restless at heart, they choose weeping and murmuring over marching and shouting for victory. When we are restless at heart, we struggle to walk by faith. Restlessness, however, does not affect our emotions alone. Scientists tell us that there is a direct line of cause and effect between too little rest, including lack of sleep, and bad choices, resulting in obesity, addictions, and more restlessness and unhappiness. Read Numbers 14, 1-10. What happened next? So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. 
but Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Things move from bad to worse. Caleb's desperate plea, only do not rebel against the Lord, in verse 9, goes unheeded, and the entire assembly prepares to stone their leaders. Restlessness leads to rebellion, and rebellion ultimately leads to death. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 390, we read, The unfaithful spies were loud in denunciation of Caleb and Joshua, and the cry was raised to stone them. The insane mob seized missiles with which to slay those faithful men. They rushed forward with yells of madness when suddenly the stones dropped from their hands. A hush fell upon them and they shook with fear. God had interposed to check their murderous design. The glory of his presence like a flaming light illuminated the tabernacle. All the people beheld the signal of the Lord. A mightier one than they had revealed himself, and none dared continue their resistance. The spies who brought the evil report crouched terror-stricken, and with bated breath sought their tents. End of quote. Right then, however, the glory of the Lord manifested itself publicly. When we read the story in Numbers 14, it seems as if the entire scene has been frozen, and we are now privy to listen in on God's conversation with Moses. God recognises that even though the stones are meant for Moses and Caleb and Joshua, ultimately the rebellion is directed against God himself. Wednesday, July 7, An Intercessor What opportunity is God offering Moses in the face of this rebellion? Read Numbers 14, verses 11 and 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me, with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence, and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. God is offering to destroy the Israelites and make a whole new nation with Moses as the father of them all. How does Moses respond to this outright rebellion, not simply against himself, but against God? Numbers 14, 13 to 19. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now, I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. This is the moment that we can see the true man of God. 
Moses' answer, frozen into time, anticipates the intercessor who, more than 1,400 years later, would pray for his disciples in their affliction, as we read in John chapter 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you have given me to do, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you, before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth." I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Indeed, in what Moses did here, many theologians and Bible students have seen an example of what Christ does for us. Their guilt, our guilt, is not even questioned. And yet Moses pleads, saying, according to the greatness of your mercy, in verse 19 of Numbers chapter 14. Please forgive these people. And just as the Lord did then because of Moses' intercession, thus he does for us because of Jesus, because of his death and resurrection and intercession for us. Thus Moses pleads, Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Numbers 14.19 Grace combats rebellion and restlessness at its core. Forgiveness offers new beginnings. Yet there are costs. Grace can never be cheap. 
Though forgiven, the people will face the consequences of their rebellions, and that generation will not enter the promised land, as we read in Numbers 14, verses 20 to 23. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice they certainly shall not see the land of which i swore to their fathers nor shall any of those who rejected me see it yes god will sustain them for another thirty-eight years in the wilderness he will feed them he will speak to them from the sanctuary he will be at their side in the wilderness but then they will die and a new generation will have to pick up the baton and find rest in the promised land it sounds like judgment yet it really was grace How would this generation be able to conquer Canaan's powerful city-states if they had not yet learned to trust him? How would they be a light to the nations when they themselves were stumbling in the darkness? And so to finish the day, what hard lessons have you learned about the consequences of forgiven sin? Thursday, July 8. Faith versus Presumption. What similarities do you see in Israel's wanderings in the wilderness and God's people living just prior to the second coming of Jesus? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all your fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day twenty-three thousand fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Um, Throughout history, God's people have been roaming in the wilderness as they seek the promised land. This wilderness has many faces. Right now, it looks like an endless media barrage, the constant beeps of incoming messages and the deep roar of interminable entertainment. It tries to sell us pornography as love and materialism as the answer to our problems. If we just could be a bit fitter, a bit younger, a bit more affluent, a bit sexier, that would take care of all our problems. Like the Israelites, we are restless in our search for peace, and so often we look for it in the wrong places. How did the Israelites react to God's judgment in Numbers 14, 39 to 45. Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning, and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountain top. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them, and drove them back as far as Hormah. 
Israel's reaction to the divine judgment is typical. We have sinned, they said. We will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, in verse 40. Half-hearted commitment is like a poorly administered vaccination. It doesn't work. Today, doctors recommend a hepatitis B vaccination right after birth within the first 24 hours of life. That's a good beginning. However, following that first shot, if there are not two or three booster vaccinations administered at the right times and in the right doses, then there is no protection against hepatitis B whatsoever. Israel's rebellious turnaround, reported in the last verses of Numbers 14, results in death and disappointment as the Israelites now refuse to accept God's new direction and stubbornly launch an attack without the Ark of the Covenant or Moses' leadership. Presumption is costly. Presumption leads to death. Very often, presumption is powered by fear. Because we are afraid of something, we make decisions that we later regret. And so to finish the day, think about a time you acted on faith and a time you acted on presumption. What was the crucial difference? Friday, July 9. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 391, Ellen White writes, Now they seemed sincerely to repent of their sinful conduct, but they sorrowed because of the result of their evil course, rather than from a sense of their ingratitude and disobedience. When they found that the Lord did not relent in his decree, their self-will again arose, and they declared that they would not return into the wilderness. In commanding them to retire from the land of their enemies, God tested their apparent submission and proved that it was not real. They knew that they had deeply sinned in allowing their rash feelings to control them and in seeking to slay the spies who had urged them to obey God, but they were only terrified to find that they had made a fearful mistake, the consequences of which would prove disastrous to themselves. Their hearts were unchanged, and they only needed an excuse to occasion a similar outbreak. This presented itself when Moses, by the authority of God, commanded them to go back into the wilderness. End of quote. And then from the Desire of Ages, page 126, But faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption, for presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey his commands. Presumption led them to transgress his law, believing that his great love would save them from the consequences of their sin. It is not faith that claims the favour of heaven without complying with the conditions on which mercy is to be granted. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the Scriptures. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, discuss the difference between faith and presumption. Why would conquering the land of Canaan first be seen as an act of faith, and then later, when the Israelites did attack, be seen as a presumptuous act? How do motive and circumstances play a big role in the difference between faith and presumption? And two, dwell more on the fact that though sin can be forgiven, we often have to live with the consequences of those sins. How can you help those who struggle with knowing that they are forgiven a sin that nevertheless still negatively impacts them and perhaps even their loved ones?
Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Impact of a Mission School, and it's by Diana Fish. What kind of impact can a mission school have on a family? Shima, which means mother in the Navajo language, heard about Holbrook Seventh-day Adventist Indian School about 40 years ago. An elderly friend spoke very highly of Holbrook Seventh-day Adventist Indian School, located on the Navajo Reservation in the U.S. state of Arizona. The school provides an excellent education to our Navajo children, he said. Shima enrolled five of her seven children at Holbrook Indian School. Her eldest son learned how to weld and to do other metal work at Holbrook Indian School. He loved working with metal and became a metal worker. Shima's second eldest child, a girl, decided to go to an Adventist college after graduating from Holbrook. She studied nursing at Pacific Union College in California and works today as a nurse on the Navajo Reservation. Shima did not send her two young children to Holbrook. She decided against it because she became unhappy with the school. One of her daughters, Nabar, had some difficulties at the school and the school ended up asking her to leave. Shima felt hurt that her daughter was not allowed to stay. Nabar not only had difficulties in Holbrook but also at every school she attended. She eventually graduated, went to college and became a teacher. Nabar is still teaching and a member of the Adventist Church today. Nabar must have forgiven Holbrook for dismissing her because she enrolled all three of her children at the school. Nabar's children, who are now young adults, have graduated from Holbrook and are doing well. One is a teacher and another is about to become a teacher. The third child is the wife of an Adventist pastor and is studying to become a teacher too. What happened to Shima's two youngest children who never attended Holbrook? The Adventist influence of Holbrook still permeated their family and both became Adventists. One teaches at an Adventist school today. What kind of impact can a mission school have on a family? Holbrook Seventh-day Adventist Indian School has had a major impact on Shima's family and many others on the Navajo Reservation and beyond. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that kick-started plans on a new gym and health centre called New Life Centre at Holbrook Seventh-day Adventist Indian School. Your offering this quarter will help finish the second phase of the centre where the school will address high rates of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, depression and suicide among Native American children and youth. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.